Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of women all tying things on this fence. Things that meant something to them. And they the would bus. send you a letter and say, will you photocopy this ten times and hand it round? And that's how it went. And people were quite inventive as well, just with the, the clothes they wore and the way that they put things together. And... Every, every single action we did was for a purpose. It was. Um, mm. And we've always felt, you know, we needed to tell people what was happening. So we said, we'll have a huge children's party with balloons and have a party. Oh, having a blast and singing songs and holding hands and singing. We shared a little cell, we wrote on walls, sang lots of songs, drove all the men to hell. I'd snip towards her, she'd snip to me. We both. And, and the whole idea was to keep getting arrested, to keep getting in, to keep, to keep being in the press, to keep saying, get out. When they were bringing the missiles into Birmingham, the actual missiles, and the group of us said, well, no, there's nothing. So we're all holding on to each other, so then you don't get scared. We weren't going to do that. We were going to peacefully say no, we were sitting in the door, refusing to move. And that's what we need again. I, I know you can't repeat Greenham, but something has got to spark and happen. Hello. This is so lovely. Thank you so much for coming to our campfire event tonight. Um, so I'm Becca and I'm just thrilled about so many of you uh, coming for this sharing, essentially. Um, first off, I'm going to introduce you to sort of like where we are and how things are going to work. And then I'll talk to you a bit about the night itself and why, why this has all come about, I suppose. So, um, so here we are. Um, if any of you have been watching any of our salons, we've been doing over lockdown um some of the that, that season two has been in here which is been where i grew up and uh, i've been calling it the secret garden but you're getting to see loads more of it than uh, than we did uh in only the salons um and uh and i've got all my sort of setup here so i'm going to kind of move around and you'll see me faff with things and to pick up my uke and light my candles and it's going to be um it's going to feel quite uh we've never done anything like this before and i didn't want it to feel super slick i wanted to feel like we were all here at the campfire basically uh, in, in hopes that we all will be again one day um so i'm not here alone in very greenham spirit we can't do this alone um i have two wonderful people helping me tonight but actually i've also had my dad lighting candles and going going crazy and being absolutely lovely and my partner looking after my dog and so it's a whole world of, as we all are you know it's, it takes a village to support an actor um but anyway um, who I have actually with me for this bit of programming is uh, the lovely Matt. So could you just at least say hello, Matt, is that right? Hello. There we go, how lovely. Um, obviously he's a man, so we're keeping him well after camera. No, I'm teasing. He's doing all my, all my sort of pushing buttons and moving stuff around because we're going to be swapping between me chatting to you and us showing you footage and music and stuff that I will tell you more about in a moment. And the other person who you will have a bit more to do with, who uh, every time the... <laughs> I'm not really an outdoorsy sort of a girl, um, <laughs> and uh, every time the fire moves or shifts, I'm like, <laughs> so um, anyway, it's, it's fine, and there are people here who know how to do fire. Um, so uh, the other person I have with me, who you'll see and be able to chat, well, talk to, not see, but we'll see at the end of the evening, is the lovely Shaz. Can you shout out, hello, Shaz? Hiya! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so she's actually sitting on the message board um, for us, so that when um, we're chatting about stuff, and there might be a, a link I mention, or, or a petition or something, she can stick it up there. But she can also answer any questions that you might have. And we'll hopefully we'll also have, um, if we will, it's not hopeful, we will have um, some sing-along moments as well, some songs that we've recorded especially for you to be able to sing with us around the campfire, um, to lift the spirits and boost morale in the same way that, that um, they did at Greenham. Um, and Shaz will post the lyrics into the message board as well. <laughs> she's, she's making an optimistic gesture. Shaz came here to do a scene with me that we'll do right at the end, a very exciting two-hander, before they lock us all down again. Um, and then right at that last minute, I, uh, I also gave the job of being on the message board and attending to my every word for your benefit so she's she's handling this new information very well um, so basically um, this is a sharing to chat about the um, all the sort of work we've been doing um, inspired by the amazing amazing powerful movement that was the, the, the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp now I expect most of you who are watching will know what I mean when I, when I say those words um, 
I fell in love with it, so I'm not going to give you a long lecture about Greenham tonight, but I'll, I'll just talk about my connection with it and why all this has kind of come about and why I love it so much. Um, and that will hopefully also fill in gaps for people who perhaps don't know as much about Greenham. So, um, so I, I was taken there as a kid by my mum. Um, I'll chat a bit more about, a bit like that later about my kind of childhood memories of it. Um, but it was a huge part of my upbringing. It radicalised, I think, both my parents, honestly. Um, and it radicalised thousands and thousands of women all over the country because people came to it from every background, every part of the country, every different age range, every different class. It's, it's a phenomenal movement. It's, you know, I, I mean, it, it's overwhelming when you think, but it's the largest women-run um, campaign since suffrage. Um, and it's a huge part of lesbian, uh, socialist, environmental history, as well as, of course, the, a, a massive, massive voice internationally in the peace movement, um, creating dialogues and changing legislation all around the world um, that is very much needed again today. So um, that was why it struck me as so uh, appalling. I'm going to say appalling. I was appalled when I got to about 40. I'm 44 now. And I know, don't stop it, I know. Um, but I, I got about, about 40 and I realised that no one younger than me, I would be talking to them about Greenham, other activists, you know, who people, like, some of them were in, in radical green movements, and they'd never heard of Greenham. It had been completely culturally robbed from them. They were having to build the wheel all over again. They weren't aware of the giants, that they, of the, the shoulders of the giants they could have been standing on, or indeed even that those giants were still running alongside them, doing amazing work, and that the movement was still, was still we were all still you know, in, in, in debt to this amazing movement. And as I say, biggest, big, biggest movement in, in women's politics since suffrage, one of the most successful, arguably, socialist campaigns in British history. Um, and if I think that had been done by men, we would all know about it and it'd be taught in schools and all the rest of it. Um, when I say successful, I'm going to come back to what I did about, about trying to get to be better known. But ba basically, um, why is it successful? I'm talking about the fact that they, there, were th there were a lot of different politics at Greenham. But the three really big main aims that they could all rally around were get rid of the cruise missiles that Margaret Thatcher had said to Ronald Reagan yeah bring them here you know and then if you have a war with Russia at least you know we'll go first you know we'll be obliterated as, as in Europe and then you can be obliterated later so like obviously that was a, an appalling idea and they were and so women literally walked all the way from Wales to to set up a camp at Greenham um, to say that's madness let's not do that um, and so and sure enough Arguably, there are people who argue this or one or the other, but I think you can't say that the fact that the Greenham, lived, the Greenham women lived outside that military base for 20 years, perpetually making a massive thorn in the side of the British and American militaries, and also worked internationally with so many of the campaigns and through the court systems and through the prison systems, uh, again, very similar to the suffragettes, they used prison and they used the courts and, and they used the media. You can't say that didn't influence and change public policy, and it certainly changed the hearts and minds. So we have a huge amount, uh, it's a huge win in my book, huge amount for us to be grateful for. They were also very concerned with the environment, huge environmental concerns. And one of the things that they, they rallied around, they were a vegetarian and vegan camp, so they're way ahead of the rest of us who've only been vegan for the last couple of years. That's me. Um, but they also, um, they, they wanted the, the common... Uh, given back to the British people because it's a beautiful place, Greenham Common. I don't know if you've been, probably a lot of you have. It's stunning. Watership Down was written, based there. It's a beautiful place. And it's got all these ugly military buildings on it and obviously it was a, it was, it was housing these terrifying missiles. And they were saying, let's give that back to the people. That, that, that shouldn't be, that's, illegal, that's illegally held by the Americans and our government, you know, have given them permission and we should, we should get it back. And actually, even when the missiles went from Greenham in that big win, they didn't stay at Greenham, those, those cruise missiles, Lots of Greenham women stayed on and worked with the locals who they'd had a more, a much more antagonistic relationship with probably up to that point. But they worked together from that point on a lot of them, the lot of the locals with a lot of the Greenham women, to get the common given back to the people. And now it is, it's ours again. We can all go there and it's lovely. That's two massive wins. Um, the third, probably big rallying aim at Greenham, I would say, feel free by the way, I'm sure Greenham women are watching this, add to the chat and tell me when I, if I'm wrong, correct me, we'll read stuff out, you know, we, we're all gonna to talk to each other through this, so if there's things that you want said, tell me and I will say them. <laughs> but basically, um, the third thing was, you know, end of patriarchy. Let's not have that. Let's have the liberation of girls and women, not just equality, but like liberation, because we don't really want the right to be equally rubbish and have an equally dangerous, crappy world. We want to, to be liberated to make the world fantastic and better and be positive change in the world. So, um, so they uh, they haven't they didn't quite manage to end patriarchy. That's still a work in progress, but that's why we're all here tonight. So that's really good. 
Um, so, uh, I think probably, I'm going to just confer with my own notes from earlier and check that I think I've told you everything. Um, I suppose the only thing I wanted to say at the beginning here is, oh yeah, is, is, is what we did about, the, uh, about, about it all. So, what I've been doing for the last uh, couple of years with an amazing, amazing group called the Heroin Collective, fantastic, Kate Carey runs that, um, we've been running an archive of uh, interviews with Green and Women. And our aim was to be really broad, to get not just women that had lived there for years, but women who visited, um, maybe women who'd visited only once and it changed their whole lives, anything any, and anything in between, everyone's different experiences. So that, so that for a start, you know, we didn't lose these vital, vital stories because um, my mum who took me, she died. We can't, we can't record her story anymore. Um, women who founded the camp, people like Helen John, have died. And as I say, we're not teaching this in schools. We're not talking about this. There are no women's studies in universities hardly anymore. This is going to be lost. So we've got a big a website called um, Green and Women Everywhere. And every month this year, we're putting up 10 different interviews. And they're just the wealth of stories and experiences are amazing. Now, tonight, is celebratory like this is a um i'll tell you what this is come out of in a moment but you're going to see um a, a, a very i suppose a lot of love and a lot of excitement from me and a lot of different artistic responses to greenham now we know we absolutely know that when you were actually living at greenham or even when you were visiting it and doing actions and being dragged off by the police and things like that it was not all fun and games and what's brilliant about this archive I think God, let's make sure we know that Kate mostly put the archive together I'm not saying my own work is brilliant <clears throat> but what is really useful about it I think <clears throat> is um, is that uh, it's got such a range of different experiences even some things where women are remembering the same instance and they've experienced it completely differently and you do get the highs the lows the love the loss you get the prison you get the mental health the physical health you know you get to hear how much those women put in and gave up and what they got out for us to have a better and safer and kinder world. So it's really brilliant. And for women to have a, to have a crack at the organisational um, majority of kind of like lifestyle, what that would be and what a non-hierarchical living space would be like. So very interesting stuff in there. I really recommend it. And, you know, we just sat back and let them do the talking. It's, it's such a resource. And those women are amazing. And lots of them have been involved in the next thing we're doing, which is what we're going to share with you tonight. So what we're doing at the moment, uh, we were hoping this year, didn't we all have hopes and dreams for this year? We were hoping this year to uh, take an exhibition on the road that showcased a lot more of this um, work to people. And we, we, we had fundraised partly through you, you wonderful people, uh, to commission artistic responses to Greenham. And um, I can see that you can't. Matt Sharon is raving at you. Okay. So I think there's a problem on, on laptop number two. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, so uh, he's dashed over and is giving her help on the message board now. Um, so basically, uh, we, we, we had all these plans and we were going to have these, this art commissioned. Uh, we'd also got um, money from the Heritage Lottery to... Um, Sorry, now Sharon went to thank him and poked his glasses off his face. So it's, it's, it's a, like a whole other comedy world back there. I'm sorry you're having to watch me, frankly. Um, so, yeah, so we, so we had uh, funding to, to put all this lovely stuff in place and work with those different partners. And then lockdown and then pandemic. So uh, what we did was we, uh, we, we, we went for a brilliant bid from the Arts Council. They, had, they did emergency fundraising. And we were benefited, we benefited hugely and were able to employ loads of fantastic actors and loads of green and women to contribute to an online exhibition. And that's what we've made. Well, it's not quite made yet. This is a sneak preview. So what we're going to share with you tonight is lots of the material from that, lots of bits and pieces. There's so much, you're only going to get a little snapshot, but at least I can, I can use it to represent to you the kind of things that are going to be on there. Um, and, then, and then you'll also get um, some lovely... Uh, some lovely bits and pieces of um, hopefully some bits of live stuff and um, and you'll get a look at the early stages of the because this site is part of it is going to be virtual reality um, and quite uh, a, a lovely kind of um, quite an, uh, an, uh, an idealized sort of like a, not, not an idealized version of Greenham because everyone remembers Greenham differently and it did change it moved around so it's not going to be a, a, photo, a photographic representation it's going to be a lovely stylized um, quite a visceral sort of thing and be quite pleasing I think and, and you'll see some very early stage some early stage kind of layouts that give you an idea of the kind of scenes that will, that will um, you'll be able to actually go into and walk around when we launch in November that online exhibition 
Um, I hope you've got to play a little bit with the other thing that we've sent you tonight, which is the campfire game. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. I hope you've got your tickets and got that link as well, because that's a lovely thing that we're really pleased with. Um, but uh, I think it's nearly enough uh, rambling opening stuff from me. What I will say is, I one of the things that I'm most passionate about about Greenham is how relevant it is now. Um, and I've chosen five um, petitions to give you to, to that um, Shaz, when she works it out, at the moment her head's in her hands, so I'm going to say not immediately. Oh, no, no, she is. She's fine. I'm getting the thumbs up. Um, she's going to put these these kind of petitions or campaigns into the um, the chat, the, the, the message board. Um, one of them is about the high-speed trains. There's a Green and Woman in our archive called Sarah Green who's really leading, uh, always a big, big, big part of pushing the campaign against that disastrous sort of stuff that's going on there with our with London's drinking water and a lot of our countryside. Um, there's a link to CND, who's still doing some really important stuff around um, new international treaties that are coming up around nuclear weapons. They're, they're doing lots of really fantastic work. Um, there's quite a few things there, and perhaps I'll chat about them a bit more um, as, as the evening goes on. So there's also obviously some feminist stuff in there, and there's also some animal stuff. Really hard to find animal um, things. I've got some, it's a, it's a farming cruelty one that I've put in there. But I just, this is a bit of a sidebar, but did you know that like it's actually quite hard to find animal campaigning stuff to support in this country because we've so we've so rigorously uh, penalised anyone fighting for animal rights. The, 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 the charges, the sentencing is so stern, way sterner than for like, oh, I don't know, raping a woman or child. Um, so it's really, it's really dramatic. Um, and that just means that, that nearly all of them are kind of the ones that were, very, that were more progressive and uh, have been nearly completely shut down. And... Um, and that's quite interesting, I think. And the media doesn't talk about that at all. So it's kind of a there are there are a lot of the people who are fighting for animal rights are real unsung heroes, and a lot of them are serving very very serious jail sentences. So there you are. Just a, but on a lighter note, um, one of the things that comes out, as I say, please go to the archive to see the the kind of gritty stuff that the women were doing, and some of that will come up in our work as in the work that we show you tonight. Um, but I'm going to start with something that just I just think of it every time. I need a bit of levity in my life because it's one of my absolute favorite stories that came out of the interviews. Um, and it's, we call it the, the <laughs> we, we gave this story to an artist who wrote uh, a song called The Ballad of Frida Geese. Because one of the things that we used to do, obviously to, um, to avoid getting criminal records and things when they got arrested was make up names and they might call themselves Frida People or, um, and so in this case, we thought that Frida Geese was right because a wonderful green woman called Becky Griffiths, you can look up her, her in the archive, um, she talks about um, the green and women are breaking into the base just every day, just every day. And the, the, they arrive and there's like a, basically just practically a picket fence and nothing else. So they're like, well, we can, we can just climb over that. So I'm guessing the Russians are also going to be able to climb over that. Uh, and so all this kind of extra security comes in. It's supposed to be a secure military base in Europe. It's like, yeah, that's not, that's not true, is it? And no matter how many layers of fence and how much razor wire, um, no matter how much, the green women are cutting and climbing and breaking in every, <laughs> pretty much every day. Um, sometimes, you know, just for individual actions and sometimes in groups. Anyway, one, one of the things that the police and military try to stop them is they try a, uh, they think, well, I know, we'll get guard geese, because they're not frightened of the guard dogs, but guard geese in a cage, they make a lot of noise. You know, that's how it used to be, let's try that. But the women, of course, aren't like, oh no, how they get past the geese, and what if they make a noise? They're like, oh, those, that awful, all oh, that awful, that awful place is now not only locking up poor innocent young recruits and things, and, and horrible, horrible bombs are in there, but they've got these poor geese in cages. So Becky Griffiths describes how she and her mum and, 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 um, and a couple of other women as well uh, decided to break in and free the geese. <laughs> and they um, soaked, uh, I think, grapes in alcohol or, or raisins in alcohol, tried to get the geese drunk. The geese weren't really interested in that. But in the end, they do manage to bunk, like get the geese out and from under their coats. Um, and then the younger women run around and make a distraction and get arrested. And the older women go off and, fr and free the geese at a local lake where they live happily ever after. <laughs> And I just think that is so lovely. So I'm going to sing you the, the piece of work that came out of that, which is the ballad of Free de Geese. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look there, officer, you don't have to see what the women of Greenham do until we want you to. 
You armed yourself with geese, you kept them in a cage. You thought that'd be enough to keep us at bay. Don't show us where they are, don't forget when we're enraged. We'll open up your fences and break down the gates. Don't look there, officer. You don't have to know what the women of Greenham do until we want you to. We didn't get the fruit, we didn't soak it in rum. We didn't cut the fence so that the other group could run. We didn't wrap the geese in a blanket for the wire. And we're not distracting you while they run for the other side. Don't look there, officer. You don't need to see the women laughing and letting the geese be free. Don't look there, officer. You don't have to see the geese flying and resting where they please. The geese flying and resting where they please. <laughs> there you go. Matt's giving me a little quiet one of those. Why, thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to, um, oh, I'll perhaps I'll say something now. We're going to put some lights on this puppy during this next bit of footage, but at the moment I can see that I'm better lit here. Um, so we're going to, um, oh, someone's creeping in behind me to put some more wood on the fire as well. This is my partner, Adrian. Just see his hands there. That subtle, as you like a ninja, darling. <laughs> They'd never have known. Um, so we're going to have a chat now with um, an amazing green woman called Sue Say. If my partner had waited but 30 seconds, we would have been off air and watching some footage. But no, he's soldiering on. Bless, bless. <laughs> and creeping away. <laughs> anyway, so the wonderful, a wonderful friend of mine called Nina Mills, who was a big part of the Me Too movement in the UK, so an awesome, uh, an awesome activist as well, um, interviewed uh, Sue Say, who was a Greenham woman who lived at Greenham for several years and is, uh, oh, she's a natural raconteuse. I'll let her do the talking. Uh, this is a, the, we've got two interviews tonight, one in the first half, one in the second half, and there are longest bits of footage. This is probably about 20 minutes, um, and that's the longest bit of footage we have. So enjoy that. Um, I introduce you now to Sue Say, uh, as interviewed by the lovely Nina Mills. What a pair. Sue, it's so great to meet you. It's lovely to meet you. Yeah, thank you so much. I've been so excited about talking to you because um, you're such a wealth of well green and experience and anecdotes and wisdom and uh and stories and all sorts so i, I can't wait i feel like i could talk to you for, for days <laughs> i'm gonna try and keep it to um to the right amount of time but um i was kind of thinking about where to start and and there's so much but i think i was really moved when i heard your account of kind of your first impressions of the camp when you first arrived and you know walking around and, and those kind of initial experiences that maybe started to shape your understanding of what Greenham was and what the values were and the way they were approaching things differently. I wonder if you could share a bit of that. I think for me it was it was obvious that I'd gone there because it was an anti-nuclear sort of fight and, and we felt that that was if we didn't stop that then we were all going to die it really was as genuine as that and I hadn't really thought beyond that except that I didn't want to be involved in any form of violent protest because that wasn't really me mm. um, and so I felt that that going to Greenham was a great a great move but when I got there it it just opened the door to so many different issues that are the same but you don't really think about. It wasn't what drew me there, but what I realized when I was there, there were so many other issues. My first experience of, of attempting to walk round the base, I'd gone from Yellowgate and I was heading towards Green and I got halfway there and at the corner, this woman was sitting, talking to this soldier and I was listening and I was horrified at what she was saying to this soldier she was confessing that she had abused her children and that violence was in all of us and that we had to challenge it where we saw it and we had to tackle it in ourselves and then stop it wherever we saw it happening. 
and she just made herself so vulnerable in that moment i thought you're insane what are you doing <laughs> giving this soldier this military man who has no understanding of what you're talking about why are you giving him something to beat you with yeah. and as he was beating her with it and she was saying yes you're right it was horrific it was awful what i did all of this dark side in me came out and this is how it came out and drink was what was was my motivator and violence and abuse of all kinds we have to stop you are standing there protecting nuclear weapons you know you shouldn't be doing this this is wrong and she just kept challenging and challenging him and i i just i realized as she continued to talk to him what she was talking about she was linking something that I suppose I'd never wanted to think about a person who'd actually committed something quite abhorrent against a child, mm. um, admitting it, but actually she was saying, I did this and now I've realized how awful this drink, this illness that I had, I wasn't accepting it, I wasn't dealing with it and this is the consequence. Mm. It was, you know, this, this drinking had to stop and I've stopped this and I'm trying to put it right now. And violence and abuse has got to stop. And she was making the bigger point. It has. It's got to stop. And yeah. whether it's nuclear weapons or whether it's, you know, something more, more in today's world, whether it's, you know, Black Lives Matter, it's got to stop. Yeah. You know, the violence and abuse of power has got to stop. Yeah. That's so powerful, Sue, and um, I want to put a pin in your reference to Black Lives Matter because I'd love to come back to that. Um, but I, I wonder if you could just talk to us about uh, when when I first heard that particular story, it, it blew my mind a little bit because I think it was the first time I, I truly understood what Greenham was about. Um, and there was something about that approach, not, not this kind of binary way of seeing your enemy and you as the good person, us and them. No. Um, but actually that there was, a, all the walls were kind of knocked down in that moment and it was just a yeah. human, another human and equal to another equal. C can you tell us a little about, bit about what effect that had on you to kind of witness that? I think that that was probably the, the moment I realised I couldn't leave. Mm. It was the moment I realised I had so much more to learn and so much more to visualise past what I thought I knew. Yeah. And I was very full of myself. I really did think I knew everything. I was, you know, and considering my, my upbringing, which was quite sheltered, I really didn't know what the hell was going on in the world. And so Greenham was my education, not just about world politics, not just about nuclear weapons, but about women and about the attitudes that we have, the preconceptions that we have. You know, prior to going to Greenham, I thought that everybody that went to jail deserved to be there. People went to jail because they committed awful crimes and they had to be locked away from us, normal society. And that, I really genuinely believe that. And when I went to Greenham, I said, I am never, ever going to prison. I am not doing that. And the day that I said that, actually, there was a, a, an event that happened that involved us um, throwing water and beef stew and various other things over a set of police after they'd squirted us with fire extinguishers, which led us to being arrested. But when we came up in court, they lied and said it was excretia and urine. So we were remanded. So there was me in the morning saying, I'm not going to jail, all those terrifying and scary people in there. And yeah. that night I was in jail. Um, wow. and it was very scary. But it was scary because the guards made you put your arms up and jump up and down. And you were in an office. There was one little curtain and there were people with typewriters and writing things. It was the most embarrassing thing I have mm -hmm. ever, ever had. Then you had. They made you bend over, you know, while they looked to see if there was anything up there. And then what was even worse, they put you in hideous clothes. 
They made you wear prison clothes, which were covered in all these lovely little tiny flowers, you know, and those knickers that came up to you, you know, to the bottom of your, your breast. They were just huge. And these things, they made you wear them. It was just quite, you know, abusive in the extreme. And the whole process of being looked at, being searched, every time you walked from one door to another, somebody would have their hands on you, was quite horrific for me. Yeah. And then I get in a cell and I'm put in a cell with these horrendous criminals. Now, let me explain to you. The woman who was nearly 80 had stolen a pint of milk. The woman who was about 35, 40, had done some social security fraud. I think it was about a hundred pounds. Um, the woman for the bottle of milk had been in on remand for eight months for pinching a pint of milk off a doorstep. You know, the, these were these awful criminals that mm -hmm. I thought were being kept away from society. And I found that there wasn't any violent crime at all in the cell that I was in. Not one person had committed a single violent crime. They were mm. all in for theft, social security fraud, you know, just about money, about yeah. poverty, about lack of opportunity. And it really opened my eyes. So when I came back to camp after that, you know, sort of seven days on remand for something I didn't do, then it came up, oh no, it was beef stew. And that's what they charged me with. Um, but the reality of it was that experience made me see that fear, that thought that society actually locked people away for a genuine reason. I'm yeah. sorry, a, a, a pint of milk, a pint of milk, yeah. a bit of social security fraud. You deserve to be in jail for that. These were hundreds of pounds. This wasn't thousands of pounds. This was a few hundred quid, yeah. you know, and I just, it showed me something that I'd never seen. I'd never seen people in that kind of poverty. Yeah. I'd never seen people struggle like that. I was brought up in a, in a, not in a, in, not in wealth at all, but we, we grew our own food, you know, to manage. We grew our own food. We had a big, big garden and we grew our own food. And my mom made everything, all our clothes. All, so we actually economized like that. We weren't in that kind of poverty where we had the state helping us or any of that kind of stuff. So that was an eye opener for me to realize that actually when you, when you are in hard times, you know, things are going to be easy, aren't they? You know, pinching that pint of milk, you know, is it the end of the world? Is it, is it jailable? Yeah, it was apparently. And that, yeah. I think that opened my eyes to the whole system being horribly upside down. And you kind of look at that kind of, that kind of, of lack of opportunities for people leads to crime, leads to, you know, this, this lack of education leads to, and people were being left behind, massively left behind. And I think that that, when I went back to Greenham and I realized that it became something that was so obvious to everybody else that was there, but because yeah. of my upbringing, I had no idea. Yeah. You know, if I'd have been brought up in a city, I'd probably have seen that. But I was brought up in a nice, quiet little village, mm -hmm. you know, in, in very, very, you know, leafy surrounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's such a powerful account of kind of how those experiences kind of changed you and opened your eyes. Um, and, well, I don't know if this is the language you would use, but politicised you and... Yeah. and kind of, yeah made you want to be part of changing that as much yes. as possible, raising awareness yeah. about it. And so much of what I love about this kind of bigger project that we're involved in is is this concept of green and women everywhere, that the legacy of green and that I think certainly continues now. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about also you know, once you, your eyes were opened, once you'd had first-hand experience of the justice system, um, what you've gone on to do or what you went on to do afterwards, you know, and, and how you kind of tried to um, use those tools and that, that learning and maybe then also talk about some of the movements that are happening now. You mentioned Black Lives Matter. You've talked about kind of your first-hand account of the, of the justice system and how it doesn't always seem to be serving the people or protecting the people that it should. Um, 
those are kind of two different questions, but I guess it's more about the legacy of Greenham afterwards. I wonder if you could yeah. talk to us a bit about that. I think probably what I would say to that is that Greenham for me sort of opened the door to realising that if you don't like something, you, you do something to change it. And the thing about Greenham was that it was never one particular thing. My choice was to live in the dirt. That was my choice. My choice was to go to prison. That was my choice. Um, my mum's choice was to help fundraise and to knit jumpers and to collect, you know, sort of goods and bring them up to, to, to Greenham. Other people were part of the phone tree. Other, other women were involved in so many different elements of Greenham. It wasn't just about the women who lived in the dirt. It was the women who went and spoke about Greenham all over the place. It was the women who went out and started teaching women how to do non-violent non direct action. So from Greenham, I went on to teach people how to do non-violent direct action. I went on to South Africa House, which was, you know, something that was a very big issue at that time. Um, I then did various other campaigns, including stopping strip searching, which, you know, the, the stop strip searching campaign was a vital sort of issue. And um, I supported and was part of the case to, to prosecute the um, Ministry of Defence Police for what they called personal searches and we proved were strip searches which were illegal and they had to pay the tiniest amount of compensation however that uh, that created the precedent that has stopped it from happening at customs and in prisons which is what we were trying to do which was stop this indiscriminate stripping of people to humiliate them and stop them from visiting their loved ones in prison um, to stop them from wanting to come into a country by strip searching them in the custom for, for looking at someone and using their profiling to decide to pick on certain people and groups of people to strip search them for for drugs or for illegal things and it's just those kinds of abuses of power um, have that particular one was was put to rest um, they do have other ones, obviously, but I think where you challenge it, you, you know, you have to challenge it each one at a time. Somebody yeah. has to take them to court and not take the money. You know, the particular person who, who did the case was offered a bucket full of money and said no, because we needed the law to be changed to stop it yeah. from happening. So I suppose, how did Green and Mould me? It made me realise the bigger thing is that everyone can do something. Whether it is, you know, I'm a bit of a technophobe, but people can use the internet now for amazing things. Instead of spreading false news, start campaigning. The things that they could be doing and are doing are quite incredible. And I think that that's the sort of new way of looking at campaigning. The old style has its place. You know, I'm the sort of person who will have the midnight vigils because I think they can be very effective. Um, but at, at a time when we're in lockdown, obviously, there are other ways that you can demonstrate hundreds and hundreds of ways you can show your support for people who are being shot in the streets, for example. Um, so I think that there are uh, hundreds of different ways that we can approach this. And if everyone does something, even if it's right to your MP, even if it is, you know, talk to your neighbours, talk to your friends about it, make sure that people are not just let in abuse of power go unchallenged. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, see, that's so, so powerful. Um, and I wonder if maybe just to finish off then, like I could ask you about uh, how you do feel about this new generation of activists who are doing things in some ways a similar way and in some ways quite differently. When you think of the new generation and obviously the huge challenges and fights that, that they have on their hands, but when you think of the way that they're approaching it, um, what feeling does it give you? What, what runs through your mind? I think that, that the only fair way of answering that is I'm so full of admiration for so much of the, the New Age campaigning. And I, I, I was losing all hope, you know, sort of 10 years ago, I started to lose all hope that young people actually knew that something bad was happening to them. And it, it was really worrying me. And I think that 
certainly the, all the all the stuff around around making our planet safe i am mm. just so you know right behind that i think it's just marvelous and some of the things that they're doing are very clever and i love that i love clever and creative and yeah. i think that maybe some things are not what i would do but that's the beauty of it that's the beauty of demonstration it's not always what you would do when somebody asked me about um, non-violence because some some forms of protests are, are not what i would take part in i said look for me, I can say living in England, I would not involve myself in violent protest. Yeah. But if I were living in South Africa during the days of apartheid, would I be so clear in that statement? Even though my heart says no, I would doubt I would hold to that living there. And so you have to look at where someone lives and the environment that they're living in because their needs they're the ones that are seeing what's happening to them they're the ones that frankly you know what can you do you have to do what you can do and i'm not going to ever discourage anybody from doing protest i would prefer it all to be non-violent protest because that is how you make change is through non-violence but i can understand in the days of apartheid when you're being shot in the streets, I can understand how difficult and challenging that can be. How could you possibly say, I'm going to be non-violent? You can only say for you and yourself. Yeah. And you can only say what kind of demonstration you'll do for you and yourself. I know now that I wouldn't do certain things that I did at Greenham. You know, we created a lot of division. We did it on purpose. We did it on purpose to, to win our cause, to get attention, to do all those sorts of things. Would I do it now? Politically not very right on, so no. But at the time, we felt that that was the means to the end. They were threatening us, our lives were threatened, so we did what we needed to do. Other people would find that abhorrent, mm -hmm. you know, so who's to say? Yeah, well, I certainly i'm so grateful for all that you have done and all that you continue to do how much of your wisdom and your experience you keep sharing over and over again and your energy and your cleverness and your creativity um so on my thank behalf you. <laughs> thank you sue i could chat to you for hours um, you're welcome i appreciate thank you all the best thank you sue bye All right, well, I'm not going to okay? cut you off completely because I think that would be really harsh, but thank you so much. Is that much. okay? Sue, it was brilliant. Honestly, I have like 10 other questions I want to chat to you about. So I just hope we get a chance to do more of these because honestly, like, it's just been such a pleasure. Oh, anytime. I, I like talking, clearly. <laughs> Amazing. Well, you're very good at it. You're so eloquent and warm with it. Um, I, I loved it. And, you know, it was really also just moving to hear about the journey you've been on in terms of. Hello there again. There was a bit of um, hello. There was a bit of argy bargy between Matt and Shaz. You know, she's already punched him back there. But um, yeah, there was a bit, a bit of argy bargy about um, whether they had finished or not. <laughs> and Shaz felt they, they, they had. And Matt then, then, then we did this. It's seamless, isn't it? Um, look, we have light. Ta-da! Tech, tech world. Um, we, we, we've been so, just carrying on praying to every goddess we know that the weather will carry on being so kind to us. And we've also, um, I sacrificed a, a Tamagotchi on an altar of iPods um, earlier in the day to try, pray that the tech works. So I do hope you're all receiving this okay. Um, and those, I mean, those, those kind of stories, um, I wanted to just let you know that both Nina and Sue are actually both interviewed in the archive. Um, Nina was a, a nursery run by Green and Women, so her stories are just, are just really a really lovely kind of cultural representation of what, what else comes out of Green and, and how that's ex experienced by people. And Sue's obviously just an amazing font of, of fantastic stories and experiences about Greenham itself. So I recommend you go and have a listen if you can. But not right now, because um, one of the things I want to tell you about now is that we've got um, some shorter pieces to share with you now. So some of the stuff we've been commissioning during um, this summer is uh, things from 
green and women who are artists themselves. So uh, one of the people, we've had people like Sue um, advising us on the site, but Sue's also written things for the site, which has been really lovely. And, uh, and she was at, at Yellow Gate or Main Gate, as it was also called. Um, the next person you're gonna see is called, uh, is called Carolyn, and she was at Green Gate. Um, and she wrote, uh, she's sent us quite a few songs that she that she did back in the day when she was there. Um, so cover like v versions of those that she's done now, but that she remembers from the camp. But she also sent me this, which I absolutely love, which is an example of her art now. Um, she's a fiddle player. She's really fabulous, and she just sent me this as a bonus, and I absolutely love it. It's called the Lockdown Waltz. I'll let you have a little look right now. I really love that, the way she gets closer and closer and closer. <laughs> It's so great, but what an amazing piece of music! Um, and uh, that idea of the gates that we were saying, um, they, as you, the women listening will know, um, they they all had their different. The, the gates were the different camps the women lived at around the base, and they all had their own personalities. So the colours, because they were challenging the hierarchy of language, they weren't trying to go uh, call them like main or, or 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 one or a or b or those things. Sort of they were trying to go, how can we be more lateral? How can we sort of diversify and uh, dissipate the power so they were, and share the power so they were so they were not they were they were colored gates was what they were called and uh yellow which had been and still was for many women main gate um that was the biggest gate but again didn't start with red you know they, and so on but there was uh red and woad and yellow and green and uh and indigo and turquoise there's loads of different gates and blue and they all have their own personalities uh and green gate was the kind of spiritual it was the um the hippie the 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 dynamic worship, um, lots of ecofeminism and stuff. Blue was your, your party gate, lots of young northern uh, uh, people near the pub, so you might stay over there if you'd had a few too, few drinks. Um, and 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 main was uh, main and yellow, very very political, um, big actions. Um, but they all they all you know share this stuff as well, and they all have their own personalities. So if you were at a gate, please post in the chat what your experience of your gate was. It'd be lovely to hear those, and I can read some out in the next little link as well. Um, I have actually been told, but Cat has posted. Thank you very much, Cat, for checking radar. Apparently, it's going to be clear all night. So. 
do we do we blame cat if it's not cooked? No, we don't do that. No, that's that's really exciting news. Hopefully, me and the and the ukulele will be all right, and the fire will be all right for a while. Um, speaking of the fire, before I sh share the next piece of work with you. Um, uh, we have uh, a fun, that, the little link that you saw. You might want to play with, uh, have a little look afterwards. Um, this uh, it was made, is a call, it's called the ca around the campfire, uh, and it's a piece of um, interactive sort of software that very very cleverly Al H Travail, who I know is a, a lover of, of the outdoor flame, um, has made for us. And it's just a beautiful. It's almost like a choose your own adventure way of kind of coasting through some of the interviews and it's just and it brings together some songs that you can listen to and it brings together some of the illustrations that we've also had made by one of the commissioned artists and they're stunning or just so yeah have a little meander around that if you're in the mood um after you've after you've done this so i'm going to introduce the next piece of um it's another, it's another piece of music um and it's a, it's really fun this um one of the women who's been advising us who i really think is such a fab person that I'm so glad I now know uh, is called Ray um, and uh, she was a blue gator and she I put a quick question out to like I have a sort of try and I try and sort of um, make sure we're checking in all the time about whether we're representing um, green and women and their experiences when we're doing the, particularly the arty stuff because there's a very fine line isn't there between celebrating and appropriating and I really don't want to don't want to be doing that I want to be a conduit I want us all in SLG and in green women everywhere to be conduits for the experiences of green and women and, and women today so uh, I sort of just put a quick text out to her, to her as a chum saying you know what songs did did you did you know to make sure we were getting them all in um, and getting them covered and things like that and uh, and she said oh she said one that I had never heard of she one of her favorite songs was take the toys from the boys so I looked into it originally poison girls it's brilliant then I gave that to two of my lovely artists um, TJ Holmes and Becky Barry who are both fantastic um, you'll hear their voices um, in some of the scenes that come up on the online exhibition as well when you when it gets gets going um, and then they made this lovely um, kind of quite cabaret-esque version of this song really great a bit like the mummers or something which I really love um, and then and I checked with Ray and she said she liked it too so I think I thought, I'm hoping we're all right and ruined her favorite song um, and um, and then we gave it to the amazing Caro Parker, Caroline Parker, who's an amazing actor, who also is um, speaks uh, is, is, a, is um, speaks BSL and does something called Signioki. So she signs two songs, and they're often hilarious and reverent, irreverent, and often grow moving as well. So I asked her if she would do as a special Signioki uh, version of "Take the Toys from the Boys" as performed by. Uh, two of our current artists in homage to the original band and to Ray, uh, my, my green and woman chum. So uh, if we could uh, play that, and that, that's what you're going to see next, the Sinioki version of Take the Toys from the Boys. Take the toys from the boys Made a bomb out of cotton Take their hands off the guns Made a bomb out of coffee Take their fingers off the triggers Made a bomb out of sugar the toys from the boys Take the toys from the boys Made a bullet out of rubber. Made 
Hi. So um, I love that, and um, I'm excited that we've got um, well, that's the, the culmination of so many different people's work all coming together with stuff, which is kind of what we're trying to do with all the elements of the of the archive, working with the wonderful team Anamorph to make the to make the actual site. Um, it, they're, they're a tech co-op, so it just feels really like it's kind of in the spirit of, of Greenham to be working in, in that way and make sure everything is as enriched and collaborative and, and passed around and. And, and pleasant as possible. Like we've, I really love working with all of the teams we've had, the art, the artists, people here today, and and animal themselves. So I hope are watching. It's, they've been fantastic to work with. I'm excited about this the online exhibition they're going to make for us. Um, we've kind of hurtled towards the end of, of the first half, which is great. Um, I'm going to just finish off. What's going to happen now for this first half? Uh, is going to be that I'm going to introduce um, a, a sing-along element to this um, and then after that um, we're going to uh, let you um, have a little break just like if you're at the theatre you can stretch your legs go for a comfort break all of those things um, have a drink whatever you like um, but um, we're going to show a slideshow during that uh, which is a mixture of photographs of women that we've archived and interviewed so the green and women now that you also the more modern pictures you'll see by the wonderful Christine Bradshaw who's off She's a wonderful photographer and she travelled all over the UK collecting as many photographs as she could of our interviewees and they're just so lovely. Um, they'd all say, I don't want to be photographed, I don't like how I look. And then she'd show them her pictures and they'd go, oh, I love that, it does look like me. And it was like, I've never seen women, I've heard lots of women say they don't like being photographed, no one does, but I've never seen people turn around and go, actually, that is me and I love it. And Christine has that absolutely magic ability. So there's pictures of those and then there's pictures from, from the archives um, that we've been, been very proud to be part of through LSE and a few green women just devote, um, ded dedicating stuff to us or donating things to our um, online um, archive so there's uh, lots of pictures from back in the day as well um, and then uh, and there's some music playing over that the amazing Carleen Anderson did as a, a unique version of one of uh, my favorite Greenham songs a Holly Near song so that's just amazing and then the fabulous fabulous Frankie Armstrong um, is, a, is the other voice that you'll hear on the next song um, with one of her classic songs from the time of Greenham but before we do that, let me hand you over to, while we've been uh, during this strange summer of lockdown, we started a mutual aid society uh, online for the Green and Women in, in our network and for anyone else that kind of found out about it through Facebook and stuff, because we knew that because of the age of some of them, they, might be, they were probably shielding from before lockdown. And we just wanted to create chances for community and things. Um, and we asked the women what they wanted and they asked for sing-alongs and quizzes and book groups and stuff like that. And we did as many of them as we kind of could over the summer. Um, and, uh, and one of the, the things we did, the most popular thing probably, was the sing-alongs. Um, and our wonderful friend, uh, activist in Extinction Rebellion and uh, choir mistress, amazing singer herself, Claire Inglehart, led those. Um, so she has very kindly recorded a couple of songs now. Uh, I think this is a one song now and a couple of songs later. Um, so Shaz is going to put the lyrics for this up in the chat room. Uh, she's giving me again a very confident look from the back of the back of the hut there, um, and uh, and then we'll have Claire uh, pop up now, and she will lead you lead you in song, and you can join in. And I will see you after the break. Thank you so much. This has been lovely. This is an absolutely amazing song by. Um the folk singer and activist Holly Near. We are a gentle, angry women, 
and what I'm going to do is sing the melody first which is um, sort of in the middle of range and then what I'd like to do is add a low harmony which will eventually be in that box down there and then a higher harmony which will be in that box up there. Um, I'm just going to sing through all three parts and probably the easiest one is the melody that the song will start with and then if you fancy busking along to either of the other parts of course give that a go and there are three verses to it. Um, I'm going to sing the first verse three times so I'll just keep signalling that and then we'll sing verse two and verse three. And then I like to repeat the first verse again a couple more times because it's just so empowering. Okay, I'm just gonna get a note from my piano. We here we go. So the, the main melody goes like this. We are a gentle angry women and we are singing, singing for our And we are singing, singing for our lives. Okay, then the next time that's sung a lower harmony, we'll add in, I think that box. Okay, maybe that box and that harmony will go like this. We are a gentle, angry women. And we are singing, singing for our lives. women and we are singing singing for our lives then the third time we sing that first verse there will be a high harmony up in that box there and that is going to sound like this we are a gentle angry women and we are singing singing for our So that's the first verse covered. The second verse is, we are the dreamers of new visions. Okay, and then the third verse is, we are the ones who care for children. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with the first verse and get another note for my piano. We. We are a gentle, angry women. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry women. And we are singing, singing for our lives. We, we are a gentle, angry women. And we are singing. Gentle, angry women 
and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are gentle, angry women, and we are singing, singing for our lives. One more time, here we go. We are gentle, angry
O Lord Apollo, God of prophecy, what is to come? What lies in the future? Careful, it is dangerous to listen to Apollo, for his light blinds like the sun does if you look at it too long. Do you know the sto story of his oracle up at Delphi? When he was a baby, he killed the dragon there that guarded the ancient oracle for old mother earth. And as soon as he won the oracle, he began to prophesy and to tell tales of gods and of heaven to mortal men. He taught them to trust reason, truth that is clear and plain. But Mother Earth was outraged, and she taught us truth could come disguised, and she gave us dreams at night, full of pith and meaning, to tell us the truth of things, past, present, and to come. But when Apollo saw his fame and fortune dimmed, he went to Zeus and begged him take the dreams away, lest women become too wise. And so Zeus took away the elusive gift and power, half light, half dark, the power of understanding that comes through dreams. And now our aching hearts no longer understand the truth in the night. We only listen now to Apollo in the light. Out of the darkness come fear of what's to come. Out of the darkness comes the dread of what's undone. Out of the darkness comes the hope that we can run and out of the darkness comes the knowledge of the sun out of the darkness comes the fear of the unknown out of the darkness comes the dread of bleaching bone out of the darkness comes the hope we are not alone and out of the darkness grow the seed we have sown out of the darkness come the fear revenge and hate out of the darkness comes the dread of indifferent fate. Out of the darkness comes the hope, hope, we are not too late. And out of the darkness come the songs that we create. Darkness is the place of birth. Darkness is the womb. Darkness is the place of rest. Darkness is the tomb. Death belongs to life. Half of day is night. The end won't come in darkness. But a blinding flash of light. I don't even know what to put. Oh. Those women at the gate witness them officers break our arms. Male violence is a very, very big
Hello again, welcome back. I hope you're all sitting comfortably and you have the libation of your choice. Um, I just want to um, actually flag that those, those little animations that we've started each half with, I just, I love them so much. And they were part of um, some work we did last year with Falmouth Uni and their film school, their animation department. Um, and the students uh, basically listened to me chatter on and then they went off and listened to the archive uh, particularly um, extracts that had been pulled together for an amazing piece of sound art that Sarah Llewellyn made for us, which again you can hear on the Green Women Everywhere website, and it's a fantastic piece of sound art. And they were very inspired by it, and um, and they made these these um, these the animations in response to the archive interviews and to that sound art. So it's a so I'm just uh, there's a there's several on our YouTube channels, and if you go there to watch them, both either Scary Little Girls or Green Women Everywhere have got them on the YouTube channels. Um, or we'll have, I think we put them on our SLG one very soon um, and they actually have their there's three of them all together and they have their full credits as well so you can see how clever the students are that actually made them and get them they get their their just desserts then and that which we cruelly robbed them of <laughs> to use them tonight and um, we're doing some more work with Farmouth Uni actually we're working with both their gaming department and their animation department and we're going to make um, video games hopefully out of the archive and the interviews which is really exciting um, we've let them I mean, you know you could do Minecraft Animal Crossing, um, you know, uh, uh, Fallout. You can make all kinds of games about Greenham, I think, versions of those things. We've said, yeah, go for your life, get in, be inventive. Um, but uh, we, all we say is it's got to be feminist, it's got to be female-centric, lots of female, mostly female characters, and it's got to be cooperative rather than combative. So that would be really interesting, a twist. So look out for those coming out, hopefully, in the next year or so. So that's quite exciting. Um, so that, 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 that one we just saw, that animation, was, was kind of came out of me talking to them about having been at Greenham as a child. Um, and that moment that little girl holds up her hands and that little face, which was, I just love that. And that, I, I really do remember those moments. I, I, my parents took me, I, I did flyering and, 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 you know, about the bomb. And, and, um, and I was at, uh, I went to the camp and when my parents were dropping off supplies, they, they lived locally and were visitors and my mum did night watch. Uh, which is when the women, if they'd come out of an action or prison and they, or they just needed a break, they could get some proper rest because other women would stay up all night and watch the, watch the tents, make sure they were safe from vigilantes or anything else um, and just let them have a good night's kip. Um, and my mum was also part of Cruise Watch, um, which was where then, you know, they would um, uh, run telephone trees about what military actions and when the cruise missiles were being moved around, these giant warheads. Uh, being moved around the country lanes, just just crazy. Um, and people from all over the country would come together to sort of go, we know what you're doing. Again, this is not a secret. And if we know what you're doing, then the Russians know what you're doing. This is not safe. And uh, and it's not safe to be moving this sort of stuff around our beautiful country anyway. So uh, all sorts of stuff, my parents were kind of involved in that way. Um, and uh, and I also was very privileged at being uh, Embrace the Base, which is this huge, again, big, one of the biggest actions since, since suffragettes. Uh, over 30,000 women and girls hold hands all the way around the nine mile fence that is the, the military base. Um, and I can just remember having holding my mum's hand on one side and having a woman I didn't know on the other side um, and me just sort of beaming up and hearing all these thousands of women singing and just never having heard that many women's voices all at one time. And when, when do you? And just looking at them both and thinking, oh my God, my mum is so cool and women are so cool. And I'm going to be a woman. Um, and I don't know. I think that's the value of that women only space has really stayed with me my whole life. And I feel like we need much more of that. Um, so, uh, so of course, my dad would have been at things like that, but making the sandwiches off at the side or running the creche. He's one of the guys that survived the Greenham. There's quite a cull of husbands at Greenham. One of the most common things that you hear Greenham women say um, in the interviews, if they were with a male partner at the beginning of, of their time, is, uh, of course, I'm not with him now. That's a really common phrase. And the women, that, I think the men that do manage to hang in there and keep the relationships are the ones that basically do just go, yes, you're right, this is your thing. What can I do to help? Okay, Marmite sandwiches. Okay, yep, got that. I'll make those and people come off the bus, they can have Marmite sandwiches when there were actions and lots of women are going to be there. Okay, oh, oh, run the crash. Absolutely, well, I'd love to, darling. So there's a lot of that sort of stuff, um, which is quite fun, I think, in the archives about who ends up with who and um, and just how pretty lesbian-tastic a lot of it gets as well, which is also always great fun. Um, so I'm going to sing you a song to welcome you back. Um, and this is a song that's very much, I kind of love the fact that 
in the archive we've got all these different memories and the songs are such a huge part of that and the smell of the wood smoke comes up a lot which i'm experiencing now it works doesn't it fire i'm really i'm toasty warm this is amazing um but basically yeah um this is a song so this is a song that i think i probably would have heard at things like embrace the bass it certainly was very familiar when i started to to learn it and come across it in the archives it comes up in a lot of the archives but in two different ways so it's it's a song by naomi little bear and it's on the amazing album we have a dream which the green and women made um back in the day with people like peggy seeger and holly near and frankie armstrong um and uh and it's beautiful actually i hadn't realized how lovely the verses are but what they used to sing a lot um, when they, they used to sing the chorus a lot when they were all holding arms and particularly when they were facing down, you know, police um, aggression and things, because they were using nonviolent direct action, which actually takes a lot of bravery. I'll talk a bit about, more about that in the next segment we have. Um, but it would often mean they were doing peaceful, brave protests in the face of ex sort of extreme aggression from military or, or police. Um, it must have been very, very intimidating. And... Um, and so some of the women, particularly women who perhaps were Green and Women visitors, so Green Women Everywhere includes women who would have visited but not lived at the camp, and uh, and they have this really kind of, oh my God, I love that, I love this song, it, it's so moving, you can't kill the spirit, she lives on and on. And then the Green Women that lived at the camp and actually heard it sort of over and over again for years and years and years, um, are a bit like, oh God, that song, she does live on and on, she goes on and on and on, doesn't she? So um, this is a song that weirdly sits in, you, you hear it referenced, in very lot of different ways in the archive and I, but actually I'm going to do it anyway and um, the people that love it please sing along hopefully Shaz has put the lyrics in the chat I should have said that anytime now Shaz to put the lyrics for you can't kill the spirit in the chat um, and then uh, and then you can sing along um, uh, or, or go for a cup of tea if you don't like it <laughs> nobody can push back an ocean it's gonna rise back up in waves And nobody can stop the wind from blowing Stop a mind from growing And somebody might stop my voice from singing But the song will live on and on can't kill the spirit she's like a mountain old and strong she goes on and on and nobody can stop a woman from feeling she has to rise up like the sun somebody might change the words we're saying but the truth will live on and on you can't kill the spirit she's like a mountain old and strong she lives on and on you can't kill the spirit she's like a mountain old and strong she lives on and on there you go so we're going to have a piece now so lots of stuff in the online exhibition uh, that we've been putting together this summer <clears throat> to complement the archive and to celebrate it and to use parts of it as artistic inspiration um, that that on uh, that exhibition um, has stuff that women are doing now in it as well. So other pieces of work uh, that younger people are making that still speaks to um, speaks to the experiences that brought women together for Greenham. This one's very specific. It's called Scored in Silence. This is a trailer. They're actually having a full screening of the film. It's an amazing physical piece of um, digital and physical theatre. It really is quite mesmeric and translates and it's digital beautifully. Um, and it's, uh, again, part, part uh, it's a BSL signed performance with lots of visuals and it's about the deaf survivors of Hiroshima. It's a really, really interesting piece and this is a trailer about five minutes about the making of it and giving you a taste of what it must be like. The full screening with a QA and a is going to go on on the 11th of November. So do, uh, do have a think about that that uh, we'll put a bit of um, info in the chat about that as well while you're watching okay thanks a lot
they were closed off. They weren't allowed to tell their stories, mm. which meant that now we're talking since the atomic bomb was dropped, 73 years, mm. their experiences, they're now 83 or maybe 84 years old now, these people. I think to hear about a story that I don't know much about or what happened, and it was um, spoken about in a really simple way. And I just think there were so many layers to it, you know, the projections for me, seeing that her movement was beautiful, and then also hearing um, from other people that experienced it in Japan, um, deaf people, and just, I guess, uh, yeah, the impact that's had on people. I guess one is, is, is to work with technology that will allow people uh, from the deaf and disabled community to be creative, to make art. Chisato uh, came to Canada a couple of times in the past just sort of explore some of the technology that we have available. Just very quickly to say, that's, that's the brilliant thing about Holocaust is that it allows you to place objects in space around a performer and kind of opens up this possibility for you know, genuine moments of interaction between the visual and the performer. And although it's a kind of flat surface, it does give you that kind of depth and dimensionality that I think is really interesting. And I, I mean, I just thought, I thought the combination with the hologores uh, was really, really great. And your um, movement to Zato was, I loved that, that it was quite, simply told the story but very deeply experienced because of the different forms of communication that were happening and i thought it was spot on absolutely spot on i've never seen anything like this before it's the first time i've any see, seen anything like this before i'm not out there there's nothing like this out there So what we're going to ask you to do today is we're going to ask you to actually wear these. And there are different wear ways you can wear them. You can kind of wear them over your shoulder like this. There are two vibrating devices on it. This device. As someone who has spent uh, a long time working with sound and trying to explore how that translates to the deaf community and the mm -hmm. deaf experience, um, there, it's particularly challenging, I think, because the nature of the way in which vibration exists in, the, in this kind of technology. Um, the stories were very sad, they were horrific. I think maybe we would feel less emotion without the vibration, but with the vibration, it became very heightened, the emotional impact. Um, there's something about uh, the experience of the deaf and the hearing world sharing um, an understanding of what happened in the, at this awful sort of time and it's really stood out the, the fact that there was in terms of oppression in, in Hiroshima that the uh, kind of double oppression that you were describing The atomic bomb story uh, occurs in Japan quite often. It comes up a lot. So when I was in Japan, one day I met a really elderly deaf woman who was telling me her account of what had happened. And she told me there were lots of other deaf people. So when I listened to this deaf woman's account, different to the hearing people, I thought, wow, she was born deaf. So she's congenitally deaf from birth, and it was her story that first inspired me. The second, trauma. Trauma of the blast and also rubble. People obviously are, are dying quite frequently, the, the few deaf people who are alive still who have that experience of the atom bomb. But the other people and the narrative that Chisato extended were people that Chisato actually met during her research. A special population lived it and still uh, lives it in, and it's part of their lives and their identities. And 
yeah, it, it definitely got me. And I think the combination with archives and visuals and performance, uh, I'm gonna go home like really, really inspired. again so yeah mesmeric piece of work have a look at that on the 11th of, of november if you're about because um i think it's gonna be an amazing evening um speaking of q a's because that show will that piece of work will have one after as well uh, we are very excited now because there's obviously loads of art that greenham do that has nothing to do with us commissioning it um and one of those is this fantastic book called other girls like me um i'm going to read you an extract of this book the author of this book is in the chat room now um, despite a huge time difference, she's over in the Catskills in America, which is hugely exciting to me because that's basically Dirty Dancing, so hooray. Um, and, uh, and she's going to um, then be, this we're going to then show an interview uh, with her and our lovely Vanessa, my lovely Vanessa, who uh, is the um, production, co-production um, woman with me on, uh, on um, running or Far Greening Women Everywhere sort of stuff. Uh, and she interviews uh, Stephanie Davis, who's this marvellous writer. I will write, I'll read you an extract of this. This is her memoirs. And it starts uh, with her arriving at Bluegate. Welcome to Bluegate. A woman with long, wild, dirty blonde hair with shaved sides and multiple ear and nose piercings was striding towards me. Before I knew it, my tent was being erected. Oh, a word I soon learned was very funny here because this was a woman's peace camp with a lot of lesbians and a local law had just been passed banning erections on the common, uh, hence the recent attempts at evictions. Uh, my name's Elena, she said in a broad Yorkshire accent as she pushed the last tent peg into the ground and stepped back to admire, admire the now upright orange tent that would be my home for the next week. Come and have some tea at the fire. I followed her shyly to the fire pit where we squeezed between two visitors who moved aside to make room for us. A posh sounding woman with a deep voice and short hair dyed to look like camouflage was speaking to a rapt group of visitors. She was talking about her hair. It's a spider's web gone wrong, she said. I'm waiting for it to grow back. I feel worst about Biscuit. Uh, she pointed to the kitchen where a large white wire-haired dog was looking for scraps. The dog had bright blue ears. Suddenly, a middle-aged man, his face tight with fury, strode past very close to us, his dog at his side. Biscuit and his dog exchanged glances and the women laughed. That's the fiddler, Elena said. He walks his dog through the camp every morning and every night and refuses to change his route, even if there's a tent in the way. He walks right over it. Elena was smiling and rolling a cigarette in licorice paper, her filthy fingernails poking out from fingerless gloves, delicately creating a perfectly rolled roll-up. Do you want one? she asked. I did, but I was afraid of how badly I rolled them and I hesitated. She put the cigarette in her lap and started to roll another and I breathed a sigh of relief. Then she lit them both, placed one to her lips and handed one to me. I was reminded of a famous scene from a Bette Davis film, unable to remember which one, as I smiled inside, thinking of how different the two of us looked from the elegant couple in the film, standing in the window um, as the dashing hero took two cigarettes in his hand, lit them and handed one to the heroine. I looked into Elena's blue eyes as she lit my roll up. I took a drag and then I looked away, afraid that she'd be able to tell that I thought she was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen with her smiling eyes, aquiline nose, slender frame and carefree nature. Cruise watch, cruise watch. We jumped up and raced through the woods, leaping over the tent pegs, skirting on the trees at top speed, visitors and green and women alike. When we arrived at the gate, Dozens of police officers were already running up the hill from town, a sea of dark blue descending upon the camp like a blot of ink, spreading to form a huge barricade, protecting the entrance to the base and blocking us from the road. Their first action left all of us stranded in the forest, unable to get to their vehicles and follow the convoy. I watched helplessly from behind the line of police officers standing shoulder to shoulder facing us. We couldn't get to the phone box on the housing estate way down the hill to call our campaign for nuclear dis disarmament friends in Newbury. 
when they got the tip off, they would set into motion a sophisticated telephone tree of cruise watchers in neighbouring villages, each person picking up the phone to make a new call as soon as they hung up. These ordinary and extraordinary men and women stopped in the middle of baking bread or gardening or fixing cars or watching TV and leapt into action. They jumped into their vehicles and fanned out around the Berkshire and Hampshire countryside to track the nuclear monsters as they crashed out around our narrow village lanes. Once, my mother saw one lurching ominously over the bridge in front of Dove Cottage, with its cooing doves living on the thatched roof in St Marybourne's village square, more used to Morris dancers with bells than nuclear missiles on convoys. They were winding like dragons through the Bourne Valley, before returning to their lairs as if Sauron of Lord Mordor had reached the Shire and all was lost. The British soldiers standing to attention inside the base were wearing what looked like World War II gas masks. They looked vulnerable as they watched the two police officers open the gate for the monsters to appear. A convoy of massive military vehicles rumbled out at top speed with American soldiers poised on the steps in glaring white head-to-toe protective gear, machine guns at the ready, as they took off between the sweet-smelling hedgerows towards a secret hidden spot where they would rehearse the moves they'd use to launch the deadly weapon. For some of us, including me, this was our first view of the Americans, and it was not a pretty one. Around me, the women were wailing with frustration, bursting into protest songs, and this slowly caught fire until we were all singing at the same volume, holding hands or each other. I turned to see Penny crying silently at the sight of so much hate, in the midst of so much verdant life, Sally holding her in her arms. We knew this would most likely be a practice, but we also knew that someday it might not. A chill formed in my heart as the reality sank in in those weapons of mass destruction were sent roaming around the countryside and one day might be launched when a president of another country thousands of miles away deemed it necessary and there was nothing we could do to stop it. Later that evening when it was all over an electric stillness descended upon the gate. I was sipping tea from a cracked mug and I walked to the entrance to chat to a policeman who was rubbing his hands to keep them warm. The police didn't have fires as we did. It was dark and the peace camp was invisible from where we stood in an eerie pool of yellow light at the entrance to the base. We were brightly illuminated for all to see as if on a film set. Don't you realise that nobody offered you any protection? I said. The Americans got the white super suits. The British soldiers got outdated gas masks. But you, you didn't get a thing. So you'd be dead now. Doesn't that bother you? He shrugged. He didn't know what to say. He was just doing his job. It is unputdownable, I have to say. I really reckon you should get your copy. It's a fantastic read. Um, I'll hand over now to the lovely Vanessa, talking to the lovely author of this work. Uh, enjoy their interview. I'll see you in a few moments. Could you start by telling us what made you first want to write this book? To begin with, I think it's because I was part of the Greenham Common movement, and it was such a massive movement of women from all over the country and around the world who descended upon Greenham Common to say no to war. And yet when you look around, you don't really see it mentioned anymore. So it partly was to shine a, a bit of a light on that period of history and try and bring it back into our consciousness, but to do it through my own personal lens, because I was a young woman with lots of ideals and I wanted to see a world that was full of peace and loving animals. And, and I, instead I was living in a world that was building up to war and based on seeing how well could we kill other people. So for someone with big ideals, it was an opportunity to really put my body where my ideals were and mm -hmm. um, be at the camp and just show where I stood on this issue. And then I guess also there was the personal liberation of being at the camp that I wanted to capture because being in a women only environment for me was very liberating. And it gave me the chance to reflect upon a relationship I'd been in with a young man that had been full of jealousy and controlling behavior and being at the camp gave me the chance to see it for what it was and also to find out you could fall in love with women. Absolutely. 
Um, and how much is the end product of the book um, the same or different from your initial vision? Are you like, this is exactly how I saw it or has it changed as you were writing it? I didn't have a vision when I started writing it at all. I went, I went to a memoir class because I write for a living, but I always write for other org for organizations and not, not for profits, mostly for doctors without borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. And I never got the chance to really do my own writing, um, but it was kind of bursting to come out of me. So I ended up doing a memoir class. And in the class, the teacher said, uh, go where the heat is. And immediately that my time at Greenham Common and that whole 18 month period where my life transformed in so many ways just came rushing back. So I started by writing about the camp and about some of the direct actions that we did. And when I read it to the group, they said, um, well, who are you? Were you an activist before? How did you get to the camp? Unless we know who you are, it's not that interesting. We need some backstory. So I kind of then started writing backwards. So I started off at that point and then, oh, I better fill in some of the background. And so I ended up having to write about my childhood and teenage years so that you could understand and be invested in me as a character in a book mm -hmm. uh, by the time I'm at Greenham Common. And then, of course, there's the other things that unfold in the book that were um, difficult to write about, but um, very easy to understand, needed to belong there. But it was learning to write about the early years I didn't expect to have to do, but I, know, I understand why. You uh, wrote in the book about what brought you to activism. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So, um, um, yes, the things in your earlier life that first sparked the activist in you, I suppose. I think the first one was not being allowed to play football at school. And I was an avid football fan. I supported Man United. I watched football every weekend. I subscribed to Shoot magazine. And my brother and I played football all the time. And then when I went to high school, or even when I was in primary school, we weren't allowed to play. But then when I went to secondary school, where my father was the headmaster, and I said, can girls play football? And it was still not allowed. So I created a girls football league, you know, you have four different houses at the school and we had, we got 44 girls to play in this league. I didn't think of it as activism at the time, but looking back, I think that was probably my first act of activism. Yeah. And then in terms of more political activism, I became involved in the anti-apartheid movement and it was very much sparked by the murder of Hector Peterson, who was the young man who was shot in the Soweto uprising. Lots of children were shot and his, he, he was the first and his picture was all over the news. And I was just completely horrified as a 15 year old to think that a student could be shot by police because he didn't want to, and none of the students wanted to learn at school in a language that they didn't speak. And that's what was going on. The apartheid regime was saying, you have to learn in Afrikaans. And these students were saying, we want to learn in our own languages. And then um, that was really very motivating for me. So. I became, I started gathering petitions and taking them to school and trying to educate my very rural white school about apartheid in South Africa. And luckily I found a woman who lived in the village next to mine who was South African, a white South African who'd been involved in the anti-apartheid movement. She kind of nurtured and mentored my activist spirit and taught me a lot, introduced me to a lot of writings of different activists in the anti-apartheid movement. So then when I went to university at Bath University, I became the the chair of the anti-apartheid group and we used to pick it outside Barclays Bank because Barclays Bank was the biggest investor and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa was asking people to to boycott the bank and we also did an action where we took over the administrative offices to ask them to disinvest from any South African investments and went on the marches in London and things like that so my yeah anti-apartheid movement was very much where my activist spirit was at that time yeah. And continued to be, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, your dad, that originally he handed you the newspaper with that picture um, in it. Um, and he's obviously, your dad has obviously got a very strong presence throughout the book. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how your dad shaped your views and the person you are? Yeah, well, my dad was a very progressive, lefty, angry young man of the 50s, I think they're called, they're very uh, concerned about the working class, 
having the right to education, having the right to housing. And he was a teacher and a headmaster. So he channeled his passion for social justice into education. And he uh, became the headmaster of the first comprehensive school in Hampshire. And he came from the north of England, moved to Hampshire to this small, very, very conservative um, village and, and pioneered the comprehensive movement, which meant that all kids of all abilities went to the school. Uh, you, did, you had mixed ability classes for the first three years. Girls could do woodwork, boys could do domestic science, you know, things like that. So he had uh, also on his bookshelves, I was very fortunate to be able to read Angela Davis and Malcolm X and uh, George Jackson, Soldad's brother. So I was exposed to a lot of very progressive writing, particularly from the civil rights in the United States movement. So a lot of my uh, inspiration and encouragement for what I wanted to do, apart from the football thing, came from him. Um, you talked uh, briefly earlier about the emotionally abusive relationship um, that you were in for a long time. Um, how specifically did Greenham help you escape from that? It gave me a sense of self-worth, a sense of confidence, a sense that I existed beyond the confines of this relationship. I wasn't just someone's girlfriend, but I was also just this person. Mm. And people were only relating to me as this person because he wasn't there. But, but until then, I had got myself into this. I'm his girlfriend and that's what gives me value. And I have to do everything I can to keep this relationship the way it is and put up with all, all of this stuff that's going on. This, name calling and not being allowed to wear what I wanted or listen to the music I wanted or talk to the friends I wanted uh, and it was such an um, ongoing insidious and continuing wearing down of self-worth that uh, yeah I got a sense of self-worth by people liking me as a person and a friend and also I had such a strong desire to make change in the world that that is what helped me propel myself away from the relationship and I, I went there on a on a visit and ended up going back very shortly after and saying I'm coming here full time and I'm leaving the relationship. But it so it was being there helped me understand it and heal from it uh, by talking about it with people and getting things into perspective and learning that that wasn't what love is. I, I actually got my first glimpses of that when I was working at Women's Aid because I started working uh, for women in a shelter and also a hotline and started to realize that apart from the physical abuse that my life was not that different from theirs in terms of the emotional make the relationship that I was in so I got my first glimmerings then and then at the camp I, 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 I got free. Yeah can you um, describe I mean the, the descriptions are so vivid um, in the book, they create such a, a sense of place and um, yeah, the feeling of being there. Can you just describe what it was like when you first arrived at Greenham, how it felt? When I first arrived to stay, because I had been on a, on a couple of the demonstrations before. Yeah, you were I to play, play. You? yeah. It was amazing and there were just tens of thousands of women tramping around the nine mile perimeter fence and holding hands and singing and putting banners on so that was very inspiring and I felt very on the outside of things like it wasn't enough for me I wanted to be part of it but I didn't really feel that I could be and that it was for me and when I went to stay the first time it was uh, I was given a, a lift by a local peace group in Manchester were taking women down for, for a couple of days and I went with them and I stayed for a week and I, it was when women, well, I think it happened a lot, but it was one of the times that women were being evicted and they'd given a call out for people, women to come and support them. And I just remember arriving and seeing all of these strong, confident looking women striding around with their big boots and baggy clothes, whatever they wanted to wear kind of thing. And uh, the police on the outside of the gate and, um, and the soldiers on the inside of the gate, the smoke coming up from the fire just the gentle sounds of women's voices and singing and yeah that's my first impression yeah. um could you tell us about the events at Aldermaston? <laughs> yes i can so do you want the whole context of 10 million women or just the yeah, whatever you'd like to tell us about it yeah well 
we were at Bluegate, I was at Bluegate, and there had been this big discussion at the camp about having 10 million women come to descend upon the base and that this would be transformative and we, we could attract that many women. And many of us felt that was too many women, it would destroy the common. There was a whole debate going on. They decided to do it, or we decided to do it, um, although I wasn't supportive of the decision. And so that evening we were at the fire and we were rah, 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 talking about it. And then uh, one of the women there said, uh, we need to take the energy away from Greenham and we need to bring attention to other things. And well, let's go to Abingdon and spray paint the planes. So we all set off. I went with them. I wasn't really like, I'd had a difficult, unpleasant, as you know, uh, experience with soldiers. So I wasn't really that keen on doing an action, but I also was young and wanted to fit in. And so I kind of went along with the whole thing. Anyway, we couldn't find Abingdon. We ended up seeing a sign for Aldermaston and went, oh, that's something nuclear. Let's go there without really thinking about what it was. And when we got there, there was no security, actually. We broke in with bolt cutters. We crawled through this area. We started walking around all these buildings. The buildings had scary signs on them. One of them said, do not stand within 15 feet of this building with a lighted match. And there were, uh, bin bags everywhere with radiation stickers on. We saw a little outdoor shed with Geiger counters and white suits. It was very spooky and it was also spooky because nobody was there and nobody was coming to arrest us and that was obviously part of the point of doing it. How far can we get in so we can get arrested so we can say look you know, this is so unsafe you can't have this kind of establishment if a bunch of untrained women can just get in there. Anyway so we ended up leaving because nobody found us <laughs> and as we came out of the area we'd crawled through we saw a sign saying um, restricted area do not enter and as we got in the car and drove back we were like what does that mean then we started to realize it was a nuclear research place maybe there was radiation so we got the number for Greenpeace from Yellowgate and we I went and called them from the phone box of the council estate down the road from Bluegate and Greenpeace said, yes, you might well have been exposed to radiation inside there. It's the UK's premier nuclear research establishment. It's where they develop Trident. They've got uranium in there, plutonium. You should get tested. But the only way you can get tested is to hand yourselves in because uh, they're not going to, you need to prove that you were in there. And that's the only way to prove it. So we ended up calling the cops, uh, Newbury Police Station and asking, saying, excuse me, we've just broken into Aldermaston, could you please come and arrest us? And they did. We asked us to go to Orange Gate. We went to Orange Gate and um, they came and arrested us. They wouldn't touch us because they thought that maybe we had been exposed to radiation. They wouldn't let us eat or drink anything because they said it might, if you have been, it'll, it's not a good idea. And then two scientists came from Aldermaston, a man and a woman, and they had this Geiger counter and they ran it over our bodies and, and it did speed up at certain points, like it crackled very fast at certain points. But when they were done, they said, you're free of radiation. And so then we got arrested, taken inside the base. And we seem to have done something worse than just going into Greenham because then our court case was going to Crown Court at Reading rather than Newbury Magistrates Court. And so, yeah. <laughs> that was that story. And finally, what would you say to young women today about how they can make a difference? I think young women today are making an incredible difference. They're doing so much. Young women, young people of all genders are making a huge difference right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, which is huge and enormous and transformative. They're really putting their bodies on the line for such an important cause. The same with Extinction Rebellion. When, when I first saw London being taken over two years ago, it made my heart sing because it reminded me of the Greenham women and it was all about the planet and interconnectedness and, and reverence for nature and trying to save the planet. So I, I, I would just say, good job, everyone, fantastic. And that in terms of what um, I think I would say is, I think more personal, which is, as an activist, I, I didn't really look at my own um, development as a person. I didn't really take care of myself in relationships. I ended up in quite some not healthy relationships with men and women. And so I think there's something about all of us that I would encourage young people in general to be very um, 
loving towards themselves and not put up with abusive behavior, emotional or physical, and realize that you are better than this and, and, and be able to get out of bad relationships sooner than I was. Mm. Very good advice indeed. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie Davis, for speaking to us. And uh, Other Girls Like Me is out on the 1st of September. Uh, so I think a lot of green women will be going out and buying it. I certainly will. I think a lot of people are going to be getting it for Christmas this year. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Hello again. It's so interesting, isn't it, when you hear those interviews, how absolutely what I think comes out for me over and over, the more interviews I hear, the more work I do around this, this stuff, the more green women I meet, the more of, of my own background as an activist as well, the more I feel like it's so relevant now to everything that's happening now. And I just think that like the connectivity that Stephanie was talking about there <clears throat> is so important. Um, and I was going to tell you a bit about the, the NVDA that I know a lot of you will, will know, Nonviolent Direct Action, uh, made famous by, by, by Gandhi using it um, in India, but actually used before that by the women's, the, by, by lots of different movements, but I know about it from the women of, of Ireland using it to, to win la the land war there. Um, uh, there's this, it's, an, it's, you know, it's a powerful tool and it, it literally involves, I mean, it's, it's creative, peaceful protest is a, is a very, uh, it has, takes many forms, but the, the very famous sort of pictures that you'll see of green women when they're lying down and things is, is often that they, you, you make yourself go completely heavy so that you have to be, to be, it's harder to move you and it's very, and that you, you know, you, it take, you, you, you are, you're not contributing to being moved, but you're not resisting uh, violently either um, and there was a Matt was saying to me uh, just before this there's just been an article in the Guardian interviewing a, a kind of very senior policeman talking about how frustrating it is when you're arresting people at, at current at climate change um, uh, protests and things they go all heavy and it's really difficult to move them and and then you look really bad because so many of you have to move one person and they've made them and they've made a real meal of being moved and it's been like yes that's exactly how that works <laughs> so you can just see again this sense of like we, we you know how much of this is is um still still tactics that are being used and that uh, activists need to be that need to know is all these things are possible for them so um and just on that note one of the other commissioned artists uh, that we have um i'm going to just show you the back of my jacket this is a jacket that my mum used to have before she died obviously and i asked this wonderful woman called diane goldie to make art out of it um, and uh, art and protest, uh, kind of, she uses, she uses textile, textile is a really big part of the Greenham protest as well, protest as well, the creative protests. So this is an example of her, she sort of, can you see enough of that? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Maxine, yes. Yeah. So she interviewed me and she then created this piece of work out of my mum's coat, which I really love. She's going to be creating some really amazing things for us next year, because next year we're going to be trying to celebrate, we're going to be celebrating, <clears throat> in whatever form that takes, the 40 years since the beginning of Greenham, since those wonderful Welsh women marched to Greenham. Um, so please join us and keep an eye on what we're doing for next year. Um, and this sort of amazing art stuff, this kind of work, will be a big part of that as well. Um, as well as all the songs and everything, of course. I'm going to show you another song now. <clears throat> um, I'm here in Cornwall, and... Um, uh, there's a, a, a lot of the, we, not, not wholly, but a lot of the, of the artists we employed to voice the scenes that the Green and Women were writing and things like that and to recreate the songs and stuff like that were, were, were Cornish actors um, to, to supporting our community down here who was so fantastic and making sure they had some work and, and trying to keep um, community going in our, in our sort of sphere during lockdown. Um, and uh, one of my, oh God, such an amazing actor, someone I grew up like totally in awe of and I'm so thrilled that she, she's she's done this piece of work for us the fantastic fan favorite beck appleby um is now going to do a cover of the uh, i mean it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a made, union made in heaven you've got fan favorite beck appleby um doing a, a cover of carrie greenham home which is of course by peggy seeger who you'll also find in our archive who's uh, everyone's fan favorite as well and uh, and very kindly did um uh, songs at uh, nights for our greenham women and as part of our mutual aid society i think she's a total hero um so please enjoy this uh, this this version this take on Peggy's classic Greenham song by the lovely 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 Becca Puppy. Hand in hand the line extends all around the nine mile fence. Thirty thousand women chant, bring the message home. Carry Greenham home, yes, near a home and far away. Carry Greenham home. 
singing voices rising higher weave a dove into the wire in our hearts and blazing fire bring the message home carry greenham home yes nearer home and far away carry greenham home no one asked us if we cared if crews should be stationed there now we've got them running scared bring the message home carry green and home yes near a home and far away carry green and home here we sit and here we stand here we claim the common land nuclear arms shall not command bring the message home carry green and home yes near a home and far away carry green and home singing voices sing again to the children to the men from the channels to the glens bring the message home carry green and home yes near a home and far away Carry Greenham home. Not the nightmare, not the scream, just a loving human dream of a peace to the ever flowing stream. Bring the message home. Carry Greenham home, yes, near a home and far away. Carry Greenham home. Woman tiger, woman dove, help to save the world we love. Velvet fist in iron glove, bring the message home. Carry green and home, yes, near a home and far away. Carry green and home. Carry green and home, yes, near a home and far away. Carry green um home. Another person. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> From one wonderful Cornish actress to another, we have the lovely Shaz Andrew here. Hello. Now we're going to uh, just. Uh, this is the, the, the we're rattling to, hurtling towards the end of the evening but first we're going to do a little scene almost like a little radio play we've got our, got our papers here got our scene um and uh and then after that we're going to spend a few minutes if you want uh answering some questions so if um shaz will um be reading your messages and relating them to me and um i can answer them verbally as it were and uh, stephanie i hope is still going to stay on and run, as a as a real life green woman and answer questions for you that you might have written um for uh, so she'll write she'll write them in the chat um so uh, so that's that's gonna happen after this but first um we're gonna read you a scene that again if you're exploring the virtual reality world of our online exhibition when it is launched in november um you will find little uh, you'll find objects around in the 3d areas and you click on them and there'll be a little scene or a song that will pop up and some of the scenes uh we've been rehearsing we had to rehearse them all over zoom and things it's been really interesting and really fun um and this one is a very simple one that allows us to be safe, socially safe and, and not too not too people heavy um which is slightly embarrassing because it's one that i wrote so um it's not me trying to promote myself it's me trying to not have too many of us in a bubble <laughs> um anyway when i wrote this uh, i was imagining a warm spring morning at green gate um Kath, who's a yellow gator, has come because she's getting headaches. And um, Scarlet, who I'll read, is, um, is tr treating her with a bit of traditional, uh, tr traditional herbal medicine. And she's sort of pottering around, <clears throat> trying to make things relaxing and doing a bit of humming to herself and doing a bit of um, work on her poultice and soothing Kath's brow. Uh, and that's the sort of setup in this, in this forest clearing at Green Gate. Out of the darkness comes the fear of the unknown. Out of the darkness comes the dread of bleaching bone. Out of the darkness comes the hope we're not alone. Out of the darkness comes the seeds that we have sown. How does that feel? 
the singing or the mushy herb thing. <laughs> it's a poultice. Like an actual poultice. As in from the Dark Ages. Oh, well, women were healing with herb law long before medieval times. But yes, I mean, how is the poultice feeling? It's uh, nice, actually. Hmm. Very soothing. So was the singing. Great bedside manner. Very <laughs> lady with the lamp. <laughs> Thanks. Did you know that the soldiers really called her the lady with the hammer? Florence Nightingale. Really? Yeah. Apparently, when she got to the field hospital and was being shown round, there was all these men in a terrible state and hardly any medicine. And then she got into a, to a, to a big locked cupboard and was told, that's where we keep the medicine for the officers in case they get wounded. Well, she demanded they open it and use it on the wounded men who were actually there dying. And, um, and when they wouldn't, she went out and got a hammer and smashed it open and gave the drugs to the needy. Regardless of rank, and the men never forgot it. They loved her for it. Why don't I know this? Where does this sappy lamp thing come from? Oh, a Victorian journalist didn't think the English readership could get on board with her real nickname, so he repackaged her in a way they would find more palatable. What a swizz. Totally. <laughs> How's the headache? A lot better, actually. Such a relief. I've had it for days. Have you been getting them regularly? Um... Yes, I have now, I think of it. I, I don't usually get them, and I haven't been ill with it at all at the camp. So it does stick out now you come to mention it. How's your menstrual cycle? Has it been disturbed at all? It's disturbed by the question. Oh, well, I'm asking because you're not the first woman to come here with headaches. A lot of women are also having problems they've never had before with their periods. Look, this isn't a zapping thing before you get into that. We're just trying to track what's happening as there definitely seems to be a trend. <sighs> well, I don't think this headache is the foundation for an international conspiracy theory. Well, you don't think that either the American or British military might be tempted to try out some new toys on a bolshy and conveniently located group of female protesters? Honestly, I've not seen the levels of competency in the military since I've been here to convince me of a devious plot with mad scientists testing f futuristic secret weapons on us. If anything, it's a rumour started to try out some psychological warfare, but even that, well, that planning is probably beyond them. Well, Equinox is actually doing some really interesting research about the history of radiation and cancer cases since the military started using Telegraph and Sonar back in the 1920s. I bet she is. Does Equinox wear a tinfoil hat too? Only at night. She doesn't want to freak out visitors in the day. It's very considerate of Equinox. Does her name make you uncomfortable? No, not at all. It's just a bit silly, isn't it? Makes it hard to take her seriously. How do you mean? Well, it's not her given name. It's she decided to make up that name, and it just doesn't give me great confidence in her judgment. Well, she gave herself the name, so I guess that makes it her given name. <laughs> What's your name after Kath? Thompson. And are you married? I was when I got here, but I'm not with him now. <laughs> So I'm guessing your second name. It may be still your married name. Or, or it's, if it's not, it's your dad's name. There's no reason that you should have um, male names, except that society gave them to you. And that's just a rule some men made up a thousand years ago. Yeah, I see that. Honestly, most women I know in the feminist movement have renamed themselves in some way. Equinox didn't want either of the names her abusive dad gave her, and she knows herself better than her abusive dad knows her. So, who better to name her than herself? She should have known better to give herself such a silly name, then. <laughs> Kath! Oh, sorry, you're right. I get it. I might be re about to rename myself. I could at least have a Greenham name, because Thompson is, well, far too ordinary, especially when it's combined with Kath. What's your name again? Sorry, Ed, like a sieve. Scarlet, oh. uh, which is my actual name that my mum originally gave me. And I love it because it is like being named after the first couple of days of my monthly blood. Oh, come on! No, really. It's a vivid reminder of the sacred feminine. We forget the link between human beings and the natural world at our peril. It is natural that I bleed and the blood is scarlet. I am the flow. I am the ebb. I am the weaver. I am the web. 
I'm going to call myself Kath Lamp Hammer, Hammer in your honour. <laughs> I love it. It's very Dianic. Mm, good-o. <laughs> and really, thanks for the poultice. It worked a treat. Oh, well, you can lay there and enjoy it if you want. It's such a lovely morning. You could just listen to the birds and enjoy the sun coming through the leaves. Mm, thanks. I, uh, I will for a minute, and then uh, I'll get back to Yellowgate. When you go, give me a shout. I'll walk with you and get some water. No, oh, I did bring some. Oh, I know. Superb visitoring. But we're having a Beltane celebration later, and I think we might need some extra. Dare I ask? I don't know, dare you. Why don't you swing back around at dusk and join us? I may do that. I may never get up. Oh, honestly, it's really comfy. <laughs> you relax and let me know if you need anything. Out of the darkness comes the fear of what's to come. Out of the darkness comes the dread of what's undone. Out of the darkness comes the hope that we can run. And out of the darkness comes the knowledge of the sun. Me and Chaz might do an adult version of that, like a sort of late night version at some point. Uh -huh. We've got a whole vision of how these two get together. Anyway. The lovely Sharon Andrews, is she great? Oh, thanks. Ah. So, um, do you want to grab the mm. laptop, Shaz, and put your other hat on now as my technical support? Mm. Um, and we'll have a little um, see if anyone's posted any questions. This is your chance to chat to us and for us to answer anything you want in the Q&A. Um, and, of course, hopefully Stephanie is also able to answer things uh, written down in the chat. Uh, so you'll get either, you can either direct a question at me or, or at Shaz, or at Matt. Um, or you can direct a, a question to, to Stephanie and she'll write you an answer. Um, or you can just ask generic questions and we will answer them at our, our best. Um, has anyone asked anything? Well, uh, <laughs> Stephanie said yes, do the adult version. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Um, what have we got? Yes, lo well, not so much questions, but lots of lovely, lovely comments. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. You've all been really lovely. I've been looking at the messages in between and it's really, really nice to see so many people and to see your, you sharing the stories of the, your actual experiences of being there. I mean, it's just really, I mean, it's a, always a, just such a massive learning curve to do stuff like this. Um, I suppose uh, if you if you want to think about those, those questions, you're really welcome. We can come back to you in a few minutes. But this is probably a good opportunity while you're kind of gearing up. Maybe you don't have any, and that's fine. But in this time, when you, just to give you a couple of minutes, I might just do a quick thank you to my team. So, Matt, do you want to just, just come out and give us a little wave? Come on, Matt. Come on, Matt. This is the lovely Matt. There he is. Look. Yay! Take him. Look at that. It's been pretty seamless, hasn't it? That Tamagotchi <laughs> sacrifice definitely worked. Absolutely worked. Worth it. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> okay, back you go. Thank you. Lovely male ally going back into his little box. Um, and, of course, you've had the lovely Shaz, my other... My other uh, Oh, fabulous person. Um, you'll, a lot of you will know her from lots of RSLG work. Um, and I know that he's listening upstairs in my house. I'd also really like to thank my dad because um, what an amazing place this is. And I know that he's also been sending Adrian down and making us keep up the fire and do a whole load of, uh, of making it beautiful. He was also the person that brought out the candles um, and the fairy lights. So there's been a lot, a lot of good dadding has gone on tonight. Um, and my partner's up there. I almost got the, the dog into this, but I'll, perhaps we'll save the dog for another night. Oh, we've got a question. Oh my goodness, we've actually got a question. Okay, go uh, for it. What are your fondest memories of Greenham? For me personally, that's, I mean, obviously my memories are of, of a five-year-old. I suspect it's probably a question that Stephanie would best place to answer. So I'll let her write. But I will just say, one of my favorite memories actually, obviously Embrace the Bass was just, huge I just loved that and I talked about that and I know I know that, that, that that's that's what we've been covered but I, I also sometimes we'd visit and I it would be quite quiet and I always felt like I could talk to any woman there for some reason unlike the rest of the world where grown-ups got kind of arsy with you sometimes about if you were, were were forward or precocious or whatever whereas this felt like a place where I could just go up to any any woman they all looked so interesting and I could go and talk to any of them and I can really remember one time probably more than one, sitting on the edge of the camp near the road. And just, they used to, the Green Women would sometimes sit with banners so that the cars going past would see slogans and campaigns and things, but also get a sense of why the women were there and why, what they felt so passionate about. And I can remember sitting with a, with a Green Woman who was just gently chatting to me about why she was there and her life and her views and things and asking me about my views and things, which is very big of her when I was a precocious five-year-old. And, um, and I remember the cars 
just the reaction of all the cars like people would go past and beep and show support and bring food and, and stop and chat and then people would also shout horrible things out of their car windows and occasionally throw stuff and I can remember thinking this is so interesting this is adult life this is what is this is what people are like they're either they're either of these car they're, 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 these cars tell me a lot about what I'm growing up into and I thought that not exactly a favourite, but a very formative memory. That's very interesting. You can also remember um, I was flyering once about the camp, and um, a, re a man uh, chose to like really question me and sort of try and intimidate me out of <laughs> being this five-year-old in in Camberley Town Centre trying to give him a flyer about nuclear <laughs> nuclear war and the need to go nuclear weapons, and uh, and all of the I remember thinking. I've got to keep my this side up. This is my this is my moment. I hope I don't crumble in the face of the man. I've got to try and put up put our case. And before I had to do anything very much, all of these women, including my mum, just swooped in and were like, "Yes, very good point, Rebecca." And another thing, sir, <laughs> and like furied at him and were like, "How dare!" You? But did it did sort of really gave him what for about picking on like this tiny child, but also without making me feel like I'd I'd got anything wrong and protecting my little ego. It's really nice. Um, just to relate, so Stephanie's answer was, thank you for asking. There are so many. I think it's the friendships that I formed, the sense of camaraderie, the silliness, the freedom to wear and cut your hair however you <laughs> liked, and sitting by the fire drinking tea late into the night under the stars to wear whatever you like, I mean, like Doc Martens and baggy clothes. <laughs> I really, again, I'm going to say there's so much in her book. I think mm. I think you'll probably relate to it a lot if Greenham's your, if Greenham's your lived experience, and I think you just like immerse us like me and Vanessa are both just like oh, wow we just can't put this book down till we finished it it's it's a great read another question oh uh, from Daisy do you feel that green and women paved the way for peaceful protest are they the grandmothers of extinction rebellion they definitely are I think that's absolutely true and loads of them in our archive I know I've interviewed and other people have interviewed we had a whole team of fantastic interviewers and Kate from Heron Collective was one of them as well uh, Heron, Heron Collective um, they, uh, there's lots of them that are working in Extinction, Extinction Rebellion groups training them how to do peaceful protest and use NVDA now and, and Extinction Rebellion have also been quite public at times, different echelons of it, of saying we are using what the Green and women did in getting mass arrest, peacefully mass arrested and then plugging up, clogging up the court systems to draw media attention and slow everything down within the system. Um, as, as a campaigning tool because the Green and Women did it, we're learning from them. So yeah, I think absolutely, um, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really powerful to get those two, those intergenerational experiences of campaigning into the same, into the same hub. I mean, just imagine what, what we can do if we're, if we're actually talking to each other and, and swapping, um, <laughs> swapping life hacks. Okay. So I'll read Stephanie's answer and then we have another question. I think that Green and Women are part of a whole history of non-violent direct mm. action from the civil rights movement to Extinction Rebellion to Black Lives Matter and more, a long historical thread of people taking mm. matters into their own hands love the idea of grandmothers of exile. Mm -hmm. um, another question, to the women who were there long term, what was the relationship like between the women and the men who worked at the base? That's quite a big question, isn't it? Um, I'll let Stephanie... Um, obviously respond to that although it's probably there's probably a lot of different responses I'll just also plug there's an amazing academic thinking thinking about um, women in peaceful protest there's an academic called Margaret Ward who writes specifically about the women who are left out of Irish history who are part of the land struggles the nationalist struggles and the feminist struggles there her, all her books about these women are amazing and they are particularly uh, her books about the Parnell sisters and things about, uh, uh, um, yeah, the, all of her, her, her the, there's a whole section of work that she does that starts there and goes through Maud Gone and Countess Markovich and things, and they all um, have uh, that lineage of peaceful, creative, female-led protest that it really gets shit done. <laughs> They're really good. Um, I know that in our um, in our archive there are lots of different accounts of the way that men, uh, the way the women and the men um, were at the base, and there's some of it is about um, really interesting. I, I, I'm you know, uh, relationships and friendships that that, that that sparked up. Some are about people leaving the, 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 the man that they moved to the base with, who they were married to, who was a military policeman, then leaving him for a green woman on the other side of the fence. And some of it is about men being quite very, there's, there's examples of hostility and cruelty um, as well. I don't know if Stephanie's had time to answer. Yeah. 
The relationships ranged from friendship to hostility. I had both. A policeman from Whitby who found my long-lost best friend for me and soldiers who held me at gunpoint and threatened to rape and kill me and throw my body in the lake. That kind of covers all the gamuts of your possible approaches, isn't it? Blimey. Mm. I think, um, yeah, I think there's... A, again, I, and I'm just encouraging you to listen to hours and hours of audio but that the archive is answers a, 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 it, there's so many things in there about I know there's one woman who isn't in the archive actually so I'll, I'll tell you this quickly now um, a woman that I met called Sue Davis uh, no relation to our lovely author on, on the chat at the moment who told she's a founder member of CND and I used to be a, a national elect member and so I got to know her and she was lovely and she hadn't had any children so she adopted people that she liked as to be her grandchildren so I got adopted in the first meeting to be her grandchild because yes. <laughs> they were all just excited that you were young and had fresh blood and would further the cause but anyway she was great and she told me that one time she was at the fence at an action she didn't live at Greenham but she did, was very involved and visited it a lot and loved it as a CND woman and um, and she had a, 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 a CND badge on her lapel and one of the um, policemen said to her through the um, through the fence um could you could you give me a, a CND badge? Because um, my I've got a seventeen year old daughter at home and she just thinks I'm scum. She hates that I work here and she we just can't get on. And she thinks you guys are just you women are just the coolest things. And I feel like if I could um, if I could if I could bring back an actual Greenham woman's actual CND badge, then it might earn me some real brownie points. So she sort of slipped him this this badge through the fence, which I think is really really nice. There is one um, sort of, uh, in the archive, there's a great interview with Bridget and Sue, and that has really great accounts of um, the best and the worst of the police, I think. There's a story that they tell about um, being united in song and rocking the fence down and things, and then hearing, so there's thousands and thousands of women all singing at a, at a mass action, and then hearing one male voice and looking over, and there's a, 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 a policeman singing along with them on the other side of the fence, and booming out in this big rich voice and she sort of says to him it's really great to hear you singing along with us and he proudly carries on singing and opens his uniform jacket and shows her a t-shirt underneath that is covered in peace badges and cnd symbols and things so that's really nice but she also tells a story about an arrest they have a children's tea party and they break in um, mothers and children and they do a tea party on the the runway of the uh, on the base where the planes come into come into land and things and the police uh round them up and put handcuffs on the women behind their backs and um, are, going, are beating them with truncheons and the Greenham women all come to the fence and start to sing and keen at them, we know what you're doing, we see you, the children see you, the children will never forget what you're doing and the police just totally sort of like, it really got to them and they released them and just sort of like pushed them all back to the Greenham women. So there's some very powerful stories that, mm. um, in, in the archive I think that might that go a long way to answer those questions. Probably do one, one more, more if there is a, one. We've got one, and I think it's a cracker. Okay, last how, one. Yeah, how can we help keep the spirit of Greenham alive now and in the future? Oh, that is a good one. Brilliant. Well, oh, I'm, I'm obviously hoping that Stephanie's going to write an answer to that because I'm sure she'll have some very strong feelings. Um, I think, I think we just have to talk about it. Apart from anything else, like take all the, like you know, take actions. You know, go to the Philia con con uh, conference. Um, do run your own reclaim the night. You know, join the school strike, support the school strikers. Um, you know, look at what Imkan are doing. Like, look look around for stuff you can join in with. But also, we, ha we have to talk about this. We have to tell young women and young people that this kind of stuff is possible. I mean, there was there was a, a woman who spoke to me, who's actually one of the writers um, who writes beautiful scenes. Um, for our online exhibition that you'll hear when, it go, when, it, when, you, when you get to explore it. Um, uh, and she was telling me, um, uh, one of her memories was of standing in the mud, um, just looking at, there'd been one of the many evictions, sometimes they were evicted several times a day, and this, the, these munch of vans would come and bailiffs would just scoop all their stuff up and chuck it in the back of these vans that just destroyed it. And she was standing there looking at these women going, okay, let's get that fire lit again, let's get the benders back over the trees, let's get, let's get make, our, you know, make our next set of homes do it all over again and she, and they're doing it with sort of kind of quite good spirit and they were just like all helping each other and they were just getting on with it and it was raining and it was muddy and she said she just looked down at them all looked around at everything and thought oh my god if we can do this and we are we can do anything and and actually we don't need men at all and she said just that was just a huge revelation and i think that's very powerful and it really would change society a lot if we were deconstructing the norms of patriarchy and capitalism and control and things and hierarchy 
and that's why this in this movement which proves that that can be possible even for for a while or even in moments that there's possibilities has been denied has been erased and denied the, the opportunity for younger people to know about it so i really 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 passionately believe we have to just keep telling each other the stories keep talking about it keep going to each other's actions and keep communicating intergenerationally mm. don't let there be a divide between old and young like get what you get get what you need from each other talk to each other share experiences share perspectives it's and share women only space it's really important uh stephanie says i see that in the spirit of the me too and the black lives matter mm. and the extinction rebellion though perhaps we need the uh, need to direct the same energy also into the peace movement again mm. given that we're still in a pretty dire situation when it comes to nuclear proliferation however there are peace activists still going uh, doing this of course yes women need to tell each other our stories because the patriarchy decides what's history gets told yeah that's really that's really well put N nicely written uh, like like your book <laughs> shall I plug again mm -hmm. right I'm not a commission for this book I just really loved it <laughs> so um, so that's that's kind of it for tonight thank you again to my amazing team and my amazing family um, and uh, I hope that you've had a lovely time and that you'll explore the the green and women everywhere and what the Scarlet girls are doing and and our digital archive which will be called green and women digital when that goes up in November and I get to, you know, hang out with you as a live audience at some point again soon. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Um, and to finish us off, um, we're going to go back to um, Claire Inglehart. So the end of this will be, you get another chance to look at the slides if you want to. And now you get a chance to look at, oh, you need to post these in the, uh, in the chat box. <laughs> um, you need to, we're going to put up some more, um, a couple, two more songs, the lyrics. And if you've been inspired by this and you feel like um, having a bit of a sing along to, to kind of, end your evening then the lovely Claire Inglehart will be here to do that with you and that's our last bit of footage and then we'll be gone so I'm going to say goodbye it's been lovely thank you so much it's a really important it, it feels huge that you've come to this and supported it and hopefully um, we'll see lots more of each other thank you so much So I'm going to do the song Trident Trident, which is to the tune of Daisy Daisy, the old folk song. Daisy Daisy, give me your answer, do. Okay, so hopefully you've all got the lyrics there, and um, there are two verses. So I'll sing it from the top all the way through the two verses, and then through those two verses again. Here we go. Trident Trident, what an insane idea! Thousands homeless. All for the sake of fear, we can't afford medication or proper education. But we must pay a million a day so that Britain can disappear. Trident, trident, the whole thing has gone too far. If we don't stop them, we're sure of a nuclear war. Before they start attacking, we'll have to send them packing and pull the chain on all who gain from the criminal arms bizarre and again trident trident what an insane idea thousands homeless all for the sake of fear we can't afford medication or proper education but we must pay a million a day so that britain can disappear Trident, trident, the whole thing has gone too far. If we don't stop them, we're sure of a nuclear war. Before they start attacking, we'll have to send them packing and pull the chain on all who came from the criminal arms bizarre. This song is Bella Ciao and it's based on the fantastic Italian protest song. So the words have been changed for Greenham and they are, we are women and we are singing. Oh Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Ciao, Ciao. We are singing for liberation. We want a non-violent revolution now. So I'm gonna do it with accordion, but I'd like to do it unaccompanied first so you have a chance to learn it. Here we go, so it goes. We are women and we are singing. Oh, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Ciao, Ciao. We are singing for liberation. 
We want a non-violent revolution now. I'll do that again. We are women and we are singing. Oh, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Ciao, Ciao. We are singing for liberation. We want a non-violent revolution now. So I'm going to do it with the accordion now and at the end of it I'll repeat the last phrase three times with a slight variation at the end so just to show you that it's going to go We are singing for liberation We want a non-violent revolution now We are singing for liberation We want a non-violent revolution now We are singing for liberation we want a non-violent revolution now! Okay, here we go. We are women and we are singing Oh, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao, Ciao, Ciao We are singing for liberation We want a non-violent revolution now And again, we are women we have